everybody. Uh, our apologies for the delay in uh, getting started uh, on this session. I'm afraid we had a slight technical difficulty uh, with uh, the computer we were going to use for the uh, webinar, and we needed to uh, do an emergency switch over to Vincent's super powerful computer. <laughs> so uh, actually, I'm just looking at the uh, number of attendees right now at the moment. And uh, it looks like we have, let me see now, uh, we are close to, wow, we are close to uh, 210 uh, people waiting online. So it's uh, good wow. to see that. Uh, Great. We have had uh, about 292 uh, registrations. So uh, great to see you all here. And uh, it's nice to see that Vincent is as popular as ever uh, with his sessions. Now, so uh, we are now live. Okay. So again, uh, apologies to everybody for the delay in getting uh, this webinar started. Uh, we had a technical issue with uh, the computer we were going to deliver a seminar on, uh, but we are now live and we are now kicking and ready for action. So Vincent O'Brien is a member of the executive committee of the ICC Banking Commission, and uh, he has very kindly uh, volunteered his uh, time here today to give us an overview of foundations of documentary credit operations, yes, which we hope is going to be a uh, one of a series of sessions we will have on various aspects of trade finance. So Vincent, uh, without further ado, thanks again for coming on board, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Thomas. And uh, you can set me up here, get me going. Yeah. Great. OK. Um, well, first of all, Thomas, thanks for this opportunity. I haven't been involved too much with EBSI for the last two years, but um, now I'm go we're planning to do some specific training on documentary credits, documentary credit operations. As Thomas said, this is a series, one of a series of uh, uh, workshops, online workshops on documentary credit operations. Uh, the second one is going to be regarding refusal of documents, in particular focusing on Article Number 16 of UCP and some other specific points along the way. But before you can build on anything, you need to have the foundations, and that's what this this workshop is about for about the next 35 to 40 minutes. So basically, let's get underway. When we think about letters of credit and the foundations of letters of credit, the foundations of letters of credit, they are based on the rules. And you all know what are the rules. The rules are the UCP, the U Uniform Custom and Practice for Documentary Credits, Publication Number 600. When I think of uh, the rule book, the UCP rule book, well, it's a small rule book. It's a book of only 39 rules. But 39 rules that are really important in facilitating trade, in billions of dollars of trade every day, in that basically every commercial documentary credit issued every day in every bank around the world, for importing and exporting goods around the world, is subject to the applicable rules. That's UCP, latest version, UCP 600, a book of 39 rules. So whether it's my good friend here in China who is actually issuing a letter of credit or maybe it's this guy here, this Irish guy who's actually actually going to ship goods under a letter of credit, these rules are of, fund of fundamental importance. Or maybe also to this lady here who is actually planning to capture the world of international trade. But let's get back to basics. Why letters of credit and why do we have the UCP and maybe a little bit of history. When we look at the world of documentary credit, there's something we need to keep in mind, and that is that the rules have been around for a long time. Being around for a long time means they have been tried, they've been tested, they have been seen to facilitate trade on an ongoing basis. When the UCP ends up in court, well, the good news is that the courts around the world tend to pay extreme uh, specific attention to how the rules articulate the obligations, the obligations of the parties involved in letter of credit operations. So UCP 600, the book of rules, 39 rules, is of fundamental importance. The rules are important, but more important are actually the players, the players who are actually involved in documentary credits. So when we look at the players, the key players are actually basically the exporter, who could be someone like me and could be an importer, someone like Thomas. But of course, these guys are in two different countries, operating subject to different laws, different regulations, different customs, different traditions. And of course, they're thousands of miles apart. But the key thing is basically different laws and different regulations. So here on the left-hand side of the screen, we have Mr. O'Brien, the exporter, who's trying to export his goods all around the world. 
And of course, there's lots of challenges, but of course, one of the key challenges is money. It's money, and that is the payment risk. The payment risk when he's ex exporting, particularly to new emerging markets with which he is not familiar, so we can break down the risk into some simple categories. First of all, O'Brien, before he ships his goods, puts his goods on board a plane or a, a ship, he is nervous about the commercial risk. The commercial risk that this guy will pay, that he will have the capacity to pay, and of course that he will have the capacity to pay in the currency of the exporter. It can happen, though, as we all are familiar, that a bank may be underwriting or undertaking or actually issuing an obligation to pay for the goods exported. So we have commercial risk, but also we have bank risk because sometimes banks go bankrupt. Sometimes banks fail, and it happens on occasion that banks do not honor their obligations. And, of course, that bank would be in a foreign jurisdiction, which makes the matter more complicated. So commercial risk, bank risk, and of course then we're exporting to countries around the world. We have different levels of country risk. Country risk basically being that something may happen in the country of destination for the goods, which means payment cannot be affected. Strikes, riots, civil commotions, war being an extreme country risk. But there are others which we will articulate later. So the exporter has significant concerns, but he's not the only one. So the importer, on the other hand, is concerned about this Irish exporter, O'Brien. And of course, he's concerned that O'Brien will ship the right goods, the right specification, the right quality, and that the goods basically will be shipped on time. So simply, we can categorize this as the performance risk. And again, as I said, this is foundation for letters of credit. In subsequent uh, online webinars, we'd be going into much more complicated and much more detailed issues. So we have conflicting needs. And the idea with the documentary, commercial documentary letter of credit is that the letter of credit will provide a bridge between the seller, O'Brien, and the buyer, Mr. Smith, in another country, in that a bank or banks will undertake to pay the seller will undertake to pay the seller provided, provided, and remember it's a documentary credit, provided the seller presents documents which evidence performance under the contract. Evidence performance. Transport documents evidencing shipment from port of loading, port of discharge, airport of departure, airport of destination. Insurance documents evidencing that the goods have been insured for a particular transit from place of departure, place of destination. And of course, we have other documents. Inspection certificates, certificates of origin, packing slips, packing notes. It, it goes on. When we look at the documentary credit, which provides a bridge between the seller and the buyer, of course, timing is of paramount importance. So as a foundation understanding letters of credit, we need to understand time and dates. And of course, mission critical is that every letter of credit will have an expiry date and place for presentation of documents. And of course, most letters of credit, but not all, will also deal with the performance risk of shipping on time. There will be a latest shipment date in the letter of credit. Not always, but it is usually recommended and required. And of course, there will be a presentation period, the period of time after shipment, when the presentation includes a, pres a transport document for presentation of the documents to the bank the bank where the credit is available. And this is a standard number of days under Article 14 of UCP, 21 calendar days. But of course, this can be modified to fit specific purposes. So the letter of credit is a bridge, a bridge between the seller and the buyer, where bank or banks undertake to make payment, or I should say, honor against presentation of complying documents. Foundation step number one. Moving on, when we look at the contract, in simple terms, the seller agrees to sell and the buyer agrees to buy. When we look a little bit more detail at the contract, it will cover the goods, shipment details, the INCO term, one of the 11 INCO terms, the price, the currency, some other items, but of course, very important, the method of payment or the method of settlement for the international contract. And of course, in this particular case, we're talking about commercial documentary letters of credit. The goods will be described in the contract, and actually in the contract, the goods description can be very long, detailed, and actually quite complex. But of course, in a letter of credit, that's not really recommended to copy and paste, although I see it quite often. We should have a concise goods description. And as a practical point, we have concise, clear goods description in the letter of credit, and then that should be referenced to the contract or to pro for or invoice or to a quotation to make it concise, clear, easy to understand, and applicable by the parties who are actually involved.
Then, of course, I mentioned dates are being very important. And, of course, there may be a shipping period in a contract or there may be a later shipping, da shipping date in the contract. And, again, this should be reflected in the documentary letter of credit. Time is important. Time is money. Our time can actually mean no money if you have a discrepancy such as late shipment, but more about the discrepancies later on. The contract will cover shipping, shipping details from, to, and of course this will also be reflected in the documentary letter of credit. We'll have port of the port of loading, port of discharge, goods going by air, airport of departure, airport of destination. So here we're talking about the foundations of documentary credit operations, the uniform custom and practice for doc documentary credits. So of course the role of documents is actually mission critical. Basically, going back in history, the purpose of these documents issued by independent parties was to provide evidence, evidence of specific facts or action, bills of lading evidencing the fact that the goods were shipped on board a named vessel at a particular port of loading for shipping to a particular port of discharge in simple terms. And of course, letters of credit call for documents and presentation of documents are required to evidence particular facts or actions. When we look at the UCP rules, the universal global rules for letters of credit, then we have specific rules for specific documents under letters of credit presented under letters of credit. For example, you know the letter of credit, the letter of credit if it calls for commercial invoices, well then article 18 commercial invoice applies. Letter of credit calls for insurance documents such as insurance policy or insurance certificate, then of course article 28 applies and then transport documents basically article 19 to 25 so think about a letter of credit issues a letter of credit is issued by a bank in Kazakhstan okay subject to UCP the confirming bank or nominated bank is a bank in Ireland once the goods are shipped by that exporter on the left and he presents his documents to the bank in Ireland, the invoice will be examined for compliance subject to Article 18, the Bill of Lading, Article Number 20, the Insurance Certificate, Article Number 28. And of course, then when the documents arrive at the bank in Kazakhstan, it's the same articles, 18, 20, 28, to which the bank will apply in examining the documents for compliance. So the rules are important. Step number two in foundations of letters of credit. Step number three is really understanding the roles of the parties and the workflow in a documentary letter of credit. Whether this letter of credit's for seven thousand dollars, and it happens at seven thousand dollars, or seven million or seventy million dollars, well, the process is basically the same. We have our exporter, we have our importer. The importer is interested in particular goods to be supplied by O'Brien in Ireland. Of course, there are a lot of factors to determine the price of the goods, including the delivery, who's organizing the insurance, who's organizing the transport, the cost of inspection, and of course, many related costs in preparing the goods for export. The seller provides the buyer with a quotation, often known as a pro forma invoice, describing seller, buyer, goods description, method of settlement, by irrevocable documentary credit. The importer examines the quotation. He decides, yes, this is good. I will order the goods. He issues a purchase order. And depending on the local regulation, depending on the requirements of the parties, they may draw up a formal international trade sales contract. But to be quite frank, uh, in many cases, it's just based on a pro forma invoice and purchase order. Now, the importer must apply to his bank, and therefore he's known as the applicant for issuance of the documentary letter of credit. The bank will review the letter of credit application form, if it's a paper application form, but of course it's recommended that we use electronic application forms to facilitate trade, but more about this in a subsequent session on technology for trade finance. The issuing bank will examine the application, review it, applicant, beneficiary, amount, latest shipment date, presentation date, expiry date and place for presentation, and then, of course, documents required. When a bank issues a letter of credit as an issuing bank, it's issuing an irrevocable and definite undertaking to honor. So, of course, there is a risk involved, and that risk of the issuing bank is basically a credit risk on the applicant. Having determined the credit risk, putting a credit line in place, the bank will issue the letter of credit in the country of the importer. It will be sent typically, but not always, but for this foundation seminar, let's keep it simple, to a bank in the country of the exporter known as the advising bank.
The advising bank's role is covered under Article 9 of the UCP, where the advising bank basically is like a post office to a degree. Oh, that's a little bit oversimplified, but the role of an advising bank is to satisfy itself as to the authenticity of the credit that it is authentic, authenticated. The credit is then advised to the beneficiary, and then the beneficiary, with the letter of credit in his hand, must review very carefully the terms and conditions of the documentary letter of credit. And of course, it's very important that the exporter determines that he will be able to comply with the terms and conditions, as a letter of credit is a definite undertaking to honor, uh, provided the beneficiary presents a complying presentation. Think about the risk. I said irrevocable documentary credit available with a nominated bank. I left out the word confirmed. So for now, imagine this letter of credit on the left-hand side is not confirmed. Well, the exporter has removed the commercial risk provided the documents comply because he's no longer, he is not relying on the importer to pay. He's relying on a bank, on a bank in the importer's country, it's operating under different regulations, different laws, maybe thousands of miles away different country. So we have removed the commercial risk, but we're still left with bank risk and we're still left with the country risk, which we explained earlier. To cover this risk, the parties may agree that the settlement method should be an irrevocable, confirmed letter of credit, whereby the issuing bank on issuing the letter of credit will authorize or request the nominated bank to add their confirmation to the letter of credit. So now assume the letter of credit has been confirmed. Exporter reviews the terms and conditions. He determines he will be in a position to comply. The goods will actually be shipped. On shipment of the goods, the documents become available. The transport come available from the transport operator, such as bill lading issued by the carrier or an agent on behalf of the carrier, or occasionally, but not so often, by the master, the captain of the vessel. The insurance documents under the letter of credit can be obtained from the insurance company, an insurance certificate or an insurance policy, and more often, an exporter will have open cover where he completes the certificate himself and he fills in the details as required under the contract, as required under the letter of credit, and then countersigns the certificate under the open cover policy. The invoice will be issued by the exporter as well as other documents and of course documents then are presented to the exporter. Exporter, But don't forget the goods have already departed and the exporter doesn't really know yet if he is going to get his money. The bank will then examine the documents to confirming that bank in a maximum of five banking days. But of course, banks will examine documents typically in one or two days. And of course, assuming the documents comply, this confirming bank will pay or to be more technical, will honor the actual letter of credit. Documents are sent typically by courier to the issuing bank. Again, on receipt of the documents, the issuing bank will examine the documents. And again, the same rule applies, maximum five banking days. But usually, of course, a bank will check the documents in one or two days. This is foundation, the first seminar, so we're keeping it simple. Assuming the documents comply, documents are released to the importer. Importer gets the goods. Exporter has got the money. Everybody should be satisfied with the foundation operation of documented credits. That is actually basically coming to the end of step number three. When we look at documentary credits in a little bit more detail and we start examining the rules, we see in Article 1 there's an articulation of actually the application of UCP. And we see that the UCP is serious body of rules because they are rules that apply to any documentary credit Okay, when the text of the credit expressly indicates it's subject to these rules. So I said UCP applies to practically every commercial letter of credit, but this commercial letter of credit will say UCP, latest version, you already know, latest version 600, comprising of 39 rules, and you should already be familiar with the features of about five of these rules we have articulated. If the rules do not satisfy a certain purpose, they can be modified or actually excluded from the credit. And again, in a subsequent, subsequent online webinar workshop, we will be articulating how to exclude, how to modify to ensure the terms and conditions satisfy the requirements of the parties. Definitions applicant means the party on whose request the credit is issued. Benef issuing bank means the bank that issues the credit. The advising bank means the bank that advises the credit. Come beneficiary means the party in whose favor the credit is issued. 
It sounds a little bit like being back at kindergarten, but for kindergarten, you need to be clear. You need to be crystal clear. The rules are clear. So when we have a letter of credit, and sometimes it will get into a situation where there may be a dispute, there may be a legal case, it may actually go before a court in a certain jurisdiction, and I have been asked the question actually by a judge, what exactly is a letter of credit? We find this in Article 2. A letter of credit, credit means an arrangement, however named or described, that is irrevocable, so under UCP 600, irrevocable, that constitutes a definite undertaking of the issuing bank, of the issuing bank to honor a complying presentation. Definite undertaking, very strong words, but actually we know sometimes there are problems with letters of credit and discrepancies, but that's for a subsequent uh, uh, discussion. But Article 2, definite undertaking of issuing bank to honor a complying presentation. Foundation step number four, complying presentation means either the delivery of documents under the credit to the issuing bank or nominated bank or the documents so delivered. So actually, in a way, someone looking at this might say there's something missing. Issuing bank, nominated bank, but where is the confirming bank? Well, there's a reason for this. And basically, a letter of credit will be available with an issuing bank or available with a nominated bank, a bank which is authorized by the issuing bank to honor. So basically, a nominated bank is a bank with which the credit may be available in an exporter's country. So when we look at the definition of presentation, we also see that it means also the documents so delivered. Exporter ships, makes a presentation to the bank, the bank examines the presentation, the presentation comply, issuing bank or confirming bank must honor, must honor. So let's just very quickly explain the concept of honor. Okay. Honor is a term to map up the three methods of basically settlement or honor under a letter of credit. But actually there is another one we'll come to in a moment, but let's just get this clear first. Foundation principle number five. Under a letter of credit, an issuing bank, okay, it may give a issue a letter of credit, so then it must honor. So honor means for a bank, for a bank to pay at site if the credit's available by site payment. This one is pretty easy to understand. Sight of documents, examination of documents, documents comply, bank makes basically or pretty much immediate payment, site payment. Second one is bank incurs deferred payment undertaking. So we incur deferred payment undertaking and undertaking up for the bank to pay at maturity if the credit's available by deferred payment. Okay, well, when I look at these, a kind of site payment seems to be the one I like most as an exporter, but maybe not, maybe not. But at the moment, that's what I like best. And then the third one is for a bank to accept a bill of exchange, draft, draft drawn by the beneficiary, of course, on a bank, and for that bank to pay at maturity if the credit's available by acceptance. So using the language or the lingo of letters of credit, honor means letter of credit available by site payment, available by deferred payment, are available by acceptance. In a few moments, we'll be looking at available with, available by, which means available where. Where is the letter of credit available? But moving on with some practical examples, which I have simplified a little bit for understanding purposes, because this is our foundation seminar. So issuing bank issues a letter of credit, and when we look closely at it, we may see that the letter of credit is available in this instance, this instance by available with the Irish Exporters Bank, but this time it's available by payment, and I've added extra words just to clarify the meaning. Payment, which means by site payment, of course, against presentation of documents. Good shit. Exporter presents presentation. Bank examines presentation, maximum five banking days. The documents comply, this confirming bank must honor, available by site payment, pay at site. So exporter now has received the funds. The goods have been shipped and most likely, if they're going by ship, they definitely are in transit between the port of loading and port of discharge. Exporter, having presented compliant presentation, has received payment. The bank has honored and this payment, this payment is without recourse under this example of letter of credit, which we said was irrevocable confirmed. So if any commercial risk ensues, any bank risk, any country risk, even if the ship 
even if the ship is arrested, but the exporter has presented complying documents, he has been paid, he has been paid without recourse. And my colleague here, Thomas, is looking at me and he's holding up a piece of paper asking me to remind you that we will be talking about the implications of sanctions on banks obligation in a subsequent workshop. So Tom, I've mentioned that you can stop waving at me now. Okay. Okay. Second example here, available by site payment and then available by deferred payment. So the exporter receives the letter of credit and available with available by. This is really the only thing that needs to change in the letter of credit because all the other specifications regarding documents, lady shipment date, etc. don't need to change. So it's available by deferred payment, which means the exporter ships, the exporter presents, the bank examines, but this time they don't pay at sight. But basically, this nominated and confirming bank, in this instance, will in writing, in writing, they will write the letter of credit number. They will write the presentation amount. And of course, I'm oversimplifying because it's foundation. But they will write something like, we incur the fair payment undertaking to mature on the maturity date, which will be calculated and uh, calculated usually from the date of shipment, but not necessarily. So exporter has no money from the letter of credit yet, okay? Has not any money from the letter of credit yet. The goods as before are on their way. And of course, in many instances, the exporter will say to the bank with which the letter of credit is available, we would like you to prepay our purchase. Well, let's be a little bit more open about it. The exporter probably will not use the word prepay or purchase. The typical language he will use is say, we would like to discount. The bank having incurred the deferred payment obligation has taken on the risk already from the time it confirmed the letter of credit. Once the documents are presented and the documents comply, that risk, dare I say, crystallizes for payment on the maturity date. Now the bank, at the request of the beneficiary, will you discount, they decide for this foundation example, yes. So they will calculate the interest from that date until the maturity date and then they will deduct that interest from the value of the documents presented by way of discount deduction. It's quite logical, it's quite simple and under this confirmed letter of credit will credit the beneficiary with the discounted proceeds and again under this confirmed letter of credit will be without recourse, of course. So think about the benefit of this product. It's actually really tremendous and a lot of my business is structuring deferred payment letters of credit. The exporter could be exporting into what he considers is a high-risk emerging market. But to be competitive, he needs to give the buyer credit terms that are competitive, maybe even six months. But by using this structure, by understanding the rules, and by being able to generate complying documents, even under the deferred payment letter of credit, the exporter can have the money without recourse off balance sheet, and he does not even have a debtor on his books for this particular transaction. And of course, the importer, on the other hand, think about it, the goods have arrived. He may sell the goods in the local market, picking a simple trans scenario. This generates the cash flow, and all going well, the cash flow is available for payment on the maturity date. But anyway, that's his cash flow. Regardless, the issuing bank has an independent undertaking to honor on the maturity date. The third example, available by site payment, deferred payment, and of course, acceptance. Few words here to be said. The key difference here is that when it's available by acceptance, the beneficiary will also present a draft. And in the current scenario, our story, that draft will be drawn on the confirming bank. Documents are presented, documents examined, documents comply, bank will accept that draft. So that draft now will stand alone stand alone as an unconditional undertaking of the confirming bank to pay on the maturity date because it has accepted in the bank's name the acceptance for payment on the maturity date. Again, the exporter may ask for prepayment or purchase or dare I say, he probably will just use the words financing or maybe he'll use the words we would like to discount. Confirming bank may finance, may prepay, may purchase, may finance or maybe the exporter will take that banker's acceptance of the confirming bank and take it to another bank and seek acceptance financing. I'm looking at time and we're going well. I'll only be about another 15 minutes, so I, ho I hope that will be okay. Moving on a little bit, I said there is another method of availability. Honor, site payment, deferred payment acceptance, but as we all know, letters of credit can also be available by negotiation. 
And under the UCP, negotiation means the purchase by the nominated bank of drafts drawn on a bank other than the nominated bank. Now, typically, but not always, but this is a foundation seminar, it's usually the issuing bank, but not necessarily. But to understand the principle, imagine the credit available with a nominated bank by negotiation and the drafts are drawn on the issuing bank. It can be site negotiation, it can be term negotiation, but picture drawn on the issuing bank, it will help understanding, and then we can look at more complex scenarios later. So, the bank negotiates by purchasing, means the purchase by the nominated bank. So you must be denominated bank, okay? So how do you purchase? You purchase by advancing or agreeing to advance funds to the beneficiary. Now again, this is my own personal opinion, but uh, when I think of negotiation, I like to see the words by advancing funds to the beneficiary, because I've been doing negotiation for a long time. And when I do it, when I do it for customers, when I do it, basically I create a loan in my books, the nominated bank, and in my category of terminology, I also call a loan an advance. I create an advance, a loan in my books, I advance that loan to the beneficiary, but I have not yet received payment or reimbursement from the issuing bank. UCP actually says advancing or agreeing to advance, and I would prefer to have those words removed, because agreeing to advance is a very fungible term, but actually advancing is an act. It's advancing funds to the beneficiary, and going back to earlier versions of UCP, it's very consistent with the whole principle of giving value. And the whole principle of giving value and negotiation goes back to checks and bank drafts, where a bank would take a check of a customer, put it in their account, credit their account, or maybe give him cash, advancing funds, giving value. So, moving forward, we have now covered honor. We've now covered, moving forward, step six, negotiation. So let's look a little bit more detail at the rules. And Thomas is waving at me here for uh, another purpose. Well, yeah, we have uh, one question here from uh, Svetlana in Minsk, uh, Belarus. Oh, great. And she is asking, uh, can you clarify uh, about the role of the nominated bank? Uh, yes. Uh, and the name is? It's a Svetlana in Minsk. Well, actually, Svetlana, maybe I'll see you next week because I will be in Minsk for the EBRD uh, graduation ceremony. And that's on the 19th of March, so maybe you're going to be there. Okay. Nominated bank. There's always a little bit of confusion of what exactly is a nominated bank. Okay. Under the UCP 600, nominated bank is a bank with which a credit is available. Now, I've covered availability just there now, available by site payment, the fair payment, available by acceptance, and then I covered in a small amount, available by negotiation. But that doesn't answer your question. What exactly is a nominated bank? Well, if we go back to UCP 500, I had a pretty good definition, and basically, the nominated was ba the bank, the bank authorized authorized by the issuing bank, authorized by the issuing bank to pay, or dare I say, authorized by the issuing bank to honor. So when the credit's issued, it's issued, for example, by SWIFT, available with, available by, there's a nominated bank stated. From the moment it's issued, the issuing bank has authorized that nominated bank to act, act, sub, act, act under its nomination. Now we're getting close to the answer. So when it's authorized, it really means you may, say it's site payment, you may pay at site. But in the context of its relationship with the exporter, it may pay at site as authorized by the issuing bank, but it has no obligation to act. It has no obligation to honor. So getting very practical, and I, I think um, this, will, this should ring a bell with you, is if a letter of credit was issued in a certain country by a certain bank, and over a period of time before the goods are actually shipped, the situation with that bank or that country uh, deteriorated, documents being presented to a nominated bank, well, the nominated bank can just uh, not act, not pay, okay? Not act pursuant to its nomination, even though under a similar credit, the month before or the month before that, it acted. So, as we mentioned, going back to step number two, if you want to cover the country risk, the bank risk, as well, of course, including the commercial risk, it should be an irrevocable confirmed credit, which means it's available with a nominated bank in practically every situation, but not all, because this is foundation course, foundation, so the bank is authorized to honor, but then by having the credit confirmed, 
it's an additional undertaking of the confirming bank. Okay, and issuing bank undertaking, article number seven, and confirming bank undertaking, article number eight. That is a very good question, Thomas. So when we're thinking about letters of credit, really, Svetlana, it's important to get the role of the nominated bank clear and concise. Yes, Svetlana just uh, typed in a uh, Bolshoi Spasiba. Okay, okay. So big thank you. Spasiba, okay, Bolshoi. Okay, moving forward, other key foundation principle of letter of credit. Moving forward, step maybe number seven, although I'm getting a little bit confused now. We need to articulate very clearly when we look at the contract on the right-hand side and the letter of credit on the left-hand side. And this is kind of a boring thing to say, but when there's a dispute, it becomes mission critical. And this is actually article number four. A letter of credit, a credit by its nature, is a separate transaction from the sale or other contract on which it may be based. And banks are kind of strong words. Banks are no way. No way. No way concerned with our bond by such contract, even if any reference whatsoever is included in the credit, the letter of credit. This is called basically the independence principle of letters of credit, and in a way it's a cornerstone of documentary letters of credit. The next cornerstone of letters of credit, well we all know about this, but it's no harm to repeat it. Repet repetition is the mother of education. Banks deal with documents and not with good service or performance to which the documents relate. Banks deal with documents and not with good service or performance to which the documents relate. So that's why the rules are known as the uniform custom and practice for documentary credits because banks deal with documents. Moving forward, foundations. A goods are shipped, documents will be presented to the bank where the letter of credit is available. Of course the UCP will apply under a commercial documentary letter of credit. And then something we're not going to cover in this particular foundation seminar because it's good news today, but in a subsequent online webinar, we'll be dealing with fraud. We'll be dealing with the fraud exception. And we'll be articulating some key cases around the world under various jurisdictions that deal with the fraud exception. But for now, we will just look at banks deal with documents, Letter of credit is a definite undertaking of an issuing bank to honor. Confirmation is additional undertaking of the confirming bank. Nominated bank is the bank authorized to honor. The bank with which the credit is available and authorized to honor, but no obligation unless it is also in the capacity of a confirming bank. But now as I come to the end, I want to articulate something uh, really important. And this is a rule that is often forgotten by documentary credit practitioners. And don't forget it, because if you forget it, at some point in time, you will regret forgetting this rule. And this rule is article number 34. Article 34, basically, when we examine it, whether you are the issuing bank, nominated bank, or confirming bank, but put yourself in the steps of a confirming bank right now, OK? And this article says very clearly, a bank assumes no liability or responsibility for the form, sufficiency, accuracy, genuineness, falsification, or legal effect of any document. Bank assumes no liability or responsibility for the description, the quantity, the weight, the quality, the condition, the packing, the delivery, or even the value or existence of the goods. Bank assumes no liability or responsibility for the good faith, acts, omissions, solvency, performance, or standing of the consignor, the carrier, the forwarder, the consignee, or the insurer of the goods, or any other person. So basically, this rule, Article 34, is telling us very seriously, very formally, don't forget that banks deal with documents. And this rule will become very important in a subsequent webinar when we're dealing with the issue of fraud. It actually ha is quite important as well when we're looking at the impact of sanctions on banks' obligation. But that's a story, Thomas, I think, for another day. Sounds good. So uh, to summarize, this is our first webinar. We've covered the foundation. We've covered the reason for documentary credits to provide a bridge between the seller and the buyer when a bank or banks will undertake to make payment. We've also covered the fact that the obligation to honor is based on documents. We've also covered the fact that honor basically includes three methods of honor. Uh, there are others, but for foundation principles available by side payment, deferred payment, and available by acceptance. 
We also introduced the concept of negotiation. And Thomas, I think, has a, another question there for me. Yeah. Yes, it's uh, from Julie in France, and uh, she's saying, uh, "Do you think there's a need for a uh, negotiation LCS uh, yeah. when a uh, UCP is revised or revised yep. uh, oh. next uh, next time round?" Um, wow, that's a big question to answer in a forum like this. And I, okay, let's try. It. Okay, my own personal opinion only is this. All we need are letters of credit available by site payment or deferred payment. So payment after shipment and presentation at site or at a later date, site or deferred. That's all we need, two methods, okay? We do not really need negotiation because remember when we looked at negotiation, we saw negotiation is where the uh, nominated bank uh, purchases by advancing funds. So basically, one way or another, they will create a loan or an advance in their books and advance the funds to the beneficiary. But actually under a deferred payment letter of credit, when I provide the financing, or dare I use the word discounting, which some people don't like using, but I use it all the time and without any difficulty, what do I do if I prepay or purchase? If I prepay, the actual functional act is I create a loan in my books, I create an advance, I create a loan in my books, but it's a discounted loan where I deduct the entrance and I pay the funds to the beneficiary. So for me, all we need is letters of credit available by site payment or available by deferred payment. But to go on just a little bit, Thomas, to add just for 30 seconds. When the letter of credit, that letter of credit would be available by site payment or deferred payment. Site payment could be available against documents alone or documents and the site draft. Now, I'm not a big fan of site draft, but if an issuing bank wanted them, why not? It can be available by site payment against documents alone or documents and a draft. Okay, your option. Second one can be available by deferred payment. Deferred payment, it could be available by deferred payment against documents alone. But also, it could be issued available by deferred payment against documents and a draft. And of course, the draft will be drawn at tenor or usens. Thus, in effect, the deferred payment letter of credit, if a draft is called to be presented, will in effect become an acceptance letter of credit. All simple, all clear, and all easily understood by our customers. So, to move on just a little bit, we then went through the workflow of the letter of credit, where we saw the workflow is uh, a seller sends the quotation or perform an invoice, purchase order, formal contract, application form, issuing bank, advising bank, Article 9, issuing bank, Article 7, maybe the letter of credit is Article 8, exporter then will ship the goods, present the documents, and we've already explained very clearly the concept of honor, the concept of negotiation. We move forward with cornerstone principles of letters of credit. That letter of credit by its nature is independent of the contract. And banks are no way concerned with such contract, even if any reference is included. Next cornerstone of uh, letter of credit operations was, of course, banks deal with documents and not with goods. And finally, we highlighted a very important article, article number 34, disclaimer. Bank is not responsible for the sufficiency, accuracy, genuineness, falsification, or legal effect of documents, etc. Just to finish, Thomas, um, I was once in a court case, uh, and finally the, the dispute was settled out of court, but uh, uh, during the case I was being cross-examined by a lawyer, and uh, he asked me to explain Article 34, and when I went through it, saying bank has no liability or responsibility for the genuineness falsification of any document, bank has no responsibility for description, quantity, weight, quality, or even existence of goods, bank has no responsibility for good faith or acts submissions of all of these parties or any other person. He responded, well, what are these banks responsible for? And of course, they are responsible to honor a complying presentation of documents under a letter of credit issued subject to the rules, the foundation rules for letters of credit, the UCP 600. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for this opportunity. That's fantastic. Thanks so much now for that, uh, Vin. So uh, just uh, can you uh, give us a quick reminder of where, what the next uh, topic or subject for the next webinar will be? Well, uh, the next 
subject is actually beginning to get technical. This was just a very simple foundation introduction. And the next top topic is actually very important in the current context of developments in the world. The next subject is actually going to be regarding the proper, accurate procedure for the refusal of documents. So receipt of the documents, examination of documents. Today we talk about complying and honoring, honoring, honoring. The next time we look at something very important, and that is the procedure for refusal of documents, the steps that are actually involved, articulation of the obligations of the parties. And I will be giving you one or two case studies where due to the consequence of failure to act correctly and subject to the rules, banks lost money. I think that would be an interesting uh, session, That's and again, like getting getting a lot more technical. Yeah, that will be very interesting. Well, listen, Vin, thanks so much now for your time. Uh, I know you're en route now to uh, uh, travel abroad once again, so uh, it, we really do appreciate that you've been able to uh, join us uh, for this session. And again, uh, to those who have joined us a little bit later, apologies for the technical issues, uh, but this webinar is uh, recorded and it will be available for review um, within the next uh, few minutes uh, on the same link that you have uh, received by email. So, uh, this so, will be uh, 30. Thank you, and Svetlana, looking forward to seeing you next week in Minsk, and from there I'm on to Turkmenistan, then on to Tajikistan, and then on to Moscow, uh, in Russia, and I'm really looking forward to seeing my friends there, and from there I'm moving on to uh, Saudi Arabia, and then I go, I can't remember, oh, Singapore, Singapore for the ICC Banking Commission meeting, I think between the 20th. Uh, and 23rd of April. It's really, really worth attending. And of course, it's open to non-members of the Commission, and it's an amazing event in Singapore. So search under Google, ICC Banking Commission, Singapore. Thanks. That's great. Thanks, Vin, and uh, see you again soon.